The following film contains graphic illustrations of human anatomy and sexual behavior. Viewer discretion is advised. U.S. Army, Fort Detrick, Maryland, once renowned for its biological warfare experiments. More AIDS virus is produced here than anywhere else in the world, but it's being grown for an entirely peaceful purpose. It's part of a race to make a vaccine against one of the most deadly and perplexing infections ever to challenge modern medicine. Around the world, there's an intense scientific effort to unravel the complexities of this strange and deadly virus. Its prime target is a human white blood cell. Usually the linchpin of the body's immune defense system, this cell is crippled and on the verge of destruction. Littering its surface, hundreds of virus particles are budding forth, ready to spread the disease. This is how AIDS begins. Over the last three or four years, we have seen every one of our worst predictions confirmed. We've, many of us felt like Cassandra, who could see the future, could speak the future, would be listened to, but would not be believed. I think from now on, the facts will speak for themselves. We are seeing the mounting number of AIDS cases in this country and around the world that we anticipated two or three years ago. We are seeing the devastating health effects, the health effects, uh, the impact on our health care delivery system. Those facts will speak for themselves. AIDS was first observed in 1981 when it affected only a small group of male homosexuals and intravenous drug users. At the time, it was just a medical curiosity. But medical science was unable to stop the disease. And today, AIDS threatens millions of lives. The disease is caused by this virus called HTLV-3. It belongs to an unusual family known as retroviruses, one of the simplest life forms on Earth. Scientists have only recently discovered how retroviruses do their damage. Within the spiky outer shell is a protein core that protects the virus's genetic heart, the key to its deadly behavior. The viral genes are permanently inserted into the normal cellular DNA of the infected cell of the particular person that, the, that got infected. So that infection of that cell is forever because the viral genes are now part of the cellular genes, integrated right in. This integration occurs when the short chain of viral genes invades the DNA of a human cell. The human cell is now taken over and infection has begun. Not only is that cell infected for a lifetime, when that cell divides, the daughter cells will also have not only the cell genes, but also the viral genes. So infection of the person is forever. And infection by the AIDS virus can spell disaster. Bobby and Bruce had been married for less than a year when she developed acute pneumonia. Her lung infection was the first indication there was a problem. I was so sick. Um, I had high temperatures. I had immediately lost 15 pounds. I had gone from 105 down to 90 right away. Um, I had difficulty breathing. I'd spent most of my day just in bed. Three years earlier, Bobby had required a blood transfusion 
At that time, there was no accurate test for the AIDS virus in blood. One of the units Bobby received was contaminated. In the summer of 1985, she was diagnosed with AIDS. I was scared. I, you know, I, I immediately thought back to the blood transfusions and knew, you know, that's exactly, you know, where it came from. And I was, first of all, very scared of dying. I mean, I, I've done a lot of reading on AIDS, being a nurse, and, you know, I, I know that the outlook was supposedly very bad, that people don't survive over three years, and the patients that I've seen who've had the AIDS, they were all very, very sick people, and, you know, just dying people. Well, it was just an unbelievable sadness that this would happen to her, you know, that uh, we were basically just starting out on our lives, and uh, to think that instead of all the good things that you try to expect, at least at the beginning, that, all, that immediately it's going to be just, you know, sickness and pain, and uh, it's very unfair. The AIDS virus targets the body's immune system, causing it to break down. Its victims succumb to infections that they can no longer fight off. The process begins in the blood. It's the body's white blood cells that are responsible for the immune defense system. There are many different varieties of white blood cell which act together to protect the body from infection. The AIDS virus attacks and kills a specific cell called the T4 helper lymphocyte. Without the T4 cells, the immune system plunges into chaos. The virus fuses with the T4 cell's outer membrane, injects its genetic blueprint into the cell, and begins the insidious process of taking control. The results can be devastating. It's devastating because First of all, it can attack the critical cell of the immune system, the cell we call the T helper, or T4 cell, which regulates much of the function of our whole immune mechanisms. And therefore, you get a lot of other infections, what we call opportunistic infections. Opportunistic infections means you have an infection by an organism which normally doesn't hurt you, but in this case, it'll hurt you because you don't have proper functioning of your immune system. Uh, things that we normally live with can kill, in other words, because your immune mechanisms are so altered. The AIDS virus doesn't attack just the immune system. Scientists now know it can also infect the brain. In infecting the brain, it can cause dementia and it can cause death directly. These are cases that often go unreported because they're not showing up as AIDS, but as brain disease. And people don't often know the virus is there. Okay, can you see these numbers here? Yeah. There are numbers like one, two, three, and four. Right. Also letters like A, B, C, and D. Right. I want you to take this pen and connect these circles, but in a special way. I okay. want you to alternate number, letter, number, letter. Scientists are trying to learn just how AIDS can affect the brain. They want to find out how many people infected with the virus show signs of mental problems and to determine the severity of their symptoms. Okay, excellent. So number, letter, number, letter, number, letter, number, letter. Researchers Mark Greenberg and Alexandra Beckett have begun a long-term psychological study of 150 people who have been infected by the AIDS virus. Ready? Go. Some people infected with the virus can experience mental problems long before they show serious symptoms of disease. This volunteer, for example, has only a mildly damaged immune okay. system. Uh -huh. Okay. I used to have a real good memory. You could give me a list of a hundred like items in the store, and I could like read them back to you, frontward, backwards, what sequence they were, and all that stuff, you know. And uh, now it's like I go to the store for five items, and I forget three of them, you know. Brain scans reveal the damage that can be done by the virus. The brain literally shrinks, and fluid, shown here in black, fills the space. Over 50% of AIDS patients may ultimately suffer from dementia. The complaints that we've most often heard are that people are having difficulty concentrating. Uh, we have commonly had people describe episodes during which they have a sudden strong emotion, unprecipitated by um, anything that, that they can point to, um, and that they feel they're performing less well than they used to at tasks that they are quite familiar with. So. By repeating the testing at regular intervals, the researchers can monitor the course of the disease. Stop. Okay. And
and the indications are that brain damage is something many people infected with the virus will increasingly have to face. I'm less upset by it. I said, well, you know, that's just what's happening. That's what it's doing. And uh, <clears throat> I live with it, you know. I mean, diabetics live with the fact they have to take insulin and they have problems with that. And, you know, I have this uh, virus and I live with the problems that it brings. So AIDS poses a double threat in attacking the immune system and the brain. How many people are at risk? It's a characteristic of this disease that many people infected with the AIDS virus do not have AIDS. But out of 100 infected individuals, about a dozen each year develop early symptoms called ARC, AIDS-related complex. With each additional year, a proportion of those with ARC will develop full-blown AIDS. Will any of those infected fight off the disease or will everyone eventually succumb? It's a crucial question because the numbers could be enormous. We have no good answer to what the percentage of people who get truly infected are who will develop fatal disease of one form or another. We can only say what a minimum is at any period of time, at least for another few years. So I, you know, I think the minimum is going to be 10% or so probably going to be significantly more. At the moment, new cases of full-blown AIDS are being diagnosed at the rate of a thousand a month. In five years, it is estimated that 270,000 Americans will have full-blown AIDS, and millions more will be infected with the virus. And everywhere around the world, the disease is on the increase. In the last few years, a lethal form of the AIDS virus has become widespread in several Central African countries. Political conditions make research difficult, but Western specialists believe that across the continent, millions are infected and tens of thousands are dying. In Europe, numbers are more certain. The three most affected countries are France, West Germany, and the United Kingdom. At the latest count, there were almost 3,000 in Europe as a whole. In the United States, 26,000 cases of AIDS have been reported, and well over a million people carry the virus without yet showing any symptoms. The disease is concentrated in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and Miami, cities with large populations of homosexuals and IV drug users. The same major risk groups are affected in Canada and Haiti, both with around 600 cases. And in South America, Brazil now has 800 cases in the cosmopolitan cities of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. As for the rest of the world, only Australia is significantly affected, with about 200 cases there. But it's in Africa that AIDS is at its most acute. With millions infected, the question has become how to account for the wide and rapid spread of the disease. At the end of 1985, an international conference was held in Brussels focusing on AIDS in Africa. Some African governments are reluctant to acknowledge an epidemic that's associated primarily with homosexuality and drug abuse. If there is AIDS in their countries, they say, it must have been brought in by Western tourists purchasing homosexual favors. It is a taboo. You know, homosexuality is culturally a taboo in our environment. And, uh, yes, uh, and um, with urbanization, poverty, and it is easy for these young men who have lost their identity from the rural setting into the urban areas, you know, to, to fall prey to these, these practices. But the weight of evidence doesn't support the argument for homosexuals spread alone. For the disease in Africa affects almost equal numbers of males and females. And this suggests that AIDS may also be spread heterosexually between men and women, thus enlarging the group of people at risk. I've become more convinced than I was before that AIDS in Africa is transmitted principally by sexual contact and principally by heterosexual contact. There may be other factors, uh, such as the uh, reutilization of hypodermic needles uh, that haven't been properly sterilized. 
and some people have said perhaps insect biting insects like mosquitoes might spread the virus. But the one thing that's come through loud and clear is that AIDS is spreading in the most sexually active uh, people in a community and particularly amongst the promiscuous. Uh, mosquitoes and needles do not select between those people uh, so very much. So I think it still comes down to saying if you want to avoid AIDS, uh, avoid having too many sexual partners. Project Aware, Suzanne speaking. Yes, I'd like to ask you some questions to see if you meet the criteria for the study. Does the right. devastation in During Africa the portend the future for the rest of the world? One group in San Francisco, Project Aware, is trying to find out how much the virus is spreading heterosexually there. So they're looking at rates of infection in women in the Bay Area. So you're afraid that you may have been exposed to the virus. Let me ask you a few questions. How long ago was that relationship? And um, was your past boyfriend uh, sleeping with other men during that time? We have three rather different risk groups. We have women who have put themselves at risk through a particular relationship with a man we know as at high risk. We may even know that he has AIDS or ARC or is antibody positive uh, or just as a member of a group with a very high rate so he's presumed to be at high risk. Then we have a group of women who are sexually quite active and may not know enough about all of their sexual partners uh, to know whether they are high-risk people or not because a casual encounter doesn't necessarily produce that kind of information. Finally, we have a group of women who are sexually quite active and expect to be paid for it. That is, women in the sex industry who uh, have a number of partners because that is what they do for a living and they expect a payment of some kind for it. So we have those three different groups at risk. The project's field workers go into the streets, recruiting from these three groups of women. The job requires patience and a diplomatic approach. <laughs> She tested about three months ago. She's yeah. supposed to test again. So I haven't seen any girls. I don't know where they are. Either everybody's done. It's a difficult thing to get people to enroll in a study like this. There are no lists. You can't look up a list of prostitutes and call them on the phone and say, will you come in? Even if there were such a list, they wouldn't come in. So we have a very skilled field staff who walk these areas. And our reputation in the community is of people who can be trusted. All right, um... Women who volunteer are given a blood test for the virus and questioned about aspects of their sexual behavior that may have put them at risk. Okay, how many men have you had sexual contact with during the last six months? <laughs> I don't exactly know how I'm supposed to answer that question. Well, I... Just tell me uh, approximately how many men you think you've had in the last six months. How many do you have per day? On the average, in the last six months, of, mm, about three a day. I mean, yeah. About three a day? Okay, do you work every day? I work about six days a week, yeah. Okay, so let's see, six times three is 18. Okay. So 18 so. a week? Yeah. So 18 a week, let's is see. The arithmetic works out at about a thousand partners a year. We have now enrolled and tested over 300 women. Um, the study is not complete, but among those early participants, we have found that about 4% of them are in fact seropositive for the virus at this point. Um, some people might regard that as very good news in that given that these are high-risk women by definition, only 4% are seropositive. On the other hand, that's a lot of women who have something to worry about. It's not just prostitutes who are contracting the virus. The AWARE study shows that sexually active women with far fewer sexual contacts are equally at risk for AIDS. Armed with this information, the field staff also works to alert women to the dangers from the virus. So you're taking extra precautions as compared to maybe a year or so ago, as far as safe sex goes? Yeah, and pretty much. More... And I believe in birth control. I'm a strong believer in birth control. Uh -huh. so. You're being fairly picky and choosy about who you're going out with anymore, is it? I always pretty much have been. So people of both sexes can be at risk for AIDS, here as well as in Africa. Many people ask us about how much it's reasonable to extrapolate from the African information to information in countries like the United States. And it's a very difficult question to discuss because on the one hand, we believe that we know of no virus that has a sexual preference, that it does in fact attack lymphocytes from both males and females, this virus. 
can it be a heterosexual disease? Clearly it can be. Everything we know about this virus suggests to us that there is no reason that it can't be transmitted from a man to a woman and possibly from women to men. In fact, if you look at the epidemiological evidence, it looks as if, as if that happens. The frequencies, nobody knows what the real frequencies are. I think the major uncertainty at this point is not can it and will it, but how fast will it, and how big the infection will be in the heterosexual population. In the United States, I think that the problem is going to be an increasing one and a subtle one, because the women and some of the straight men who are infected may truly have no knowledge that they had been involved in behavior that would get them infected and therefore may may truly not know that they're at risk or risking others one message is clear for both men and women preventing aids will mean safe sex avoiding physical contact with other people's bodily fluids there's definite proof that a woman can be infected via her vagina this happened to four women in Australia following artificial insemination with contaminated semen. The virus may not penetrate the thick walls of the vagina itself, but it can probably enter a woman's bloodstream via the uterus with its rich supply of surface vessels. When a woman is infected, the virus becomes present in vaginal secretions, presenting in turn a danger to males. There's no evidence to say exactly how the AIDS virus infects men. Promiscuous men sometimes have an inflamed urethra due to other sexually transmitted diseases. Possibly a small sore just inside the penis may offer a route of entry. Condoms are definitely a sensible precaution. Homosexual anal intercourse has frequently been blamed for spreading the disease. Unlike the vagina, the lining of the rectum is thin and bleeds easily. One theory is that infected semen might cross into the passive partner's bloodstream or because the lower intestine swarms with the same T-cells the AIDS virus targets, a direct cell-to-cell -cell infection route might be possible. And there is yet another group at risk for AIDS in Western countries, intravenous drug users. The habit of sharing needles means that withdrawn blood is often left behind in the syringe between fixes. It's a perfect way to spread a blood-borne virus. The link with sex and drugs, behavior considered illicit or taboo, is another deadly aspect of AIDS. It makes public education controversial, and it exposes victims of the disease to prejudice and fears. Well, that's what hurt me the most, the fact that I was a nurse in the hospital. They all knew I was a nurse in the hospital, and I was right, um, my room was right outside the nurse's station, so I could always hear them talking about me, there was one nurse who actually refused to take care of me, which that hurt. I, was, I wasn't referred to as Bobby. They referred to me as the nurse with AIDS. And, I mean, I just kept thinking that if this is how they treat a fellow nurse, what do they do to the other patients there? But the AIDS virus is fragile and is not casually transmitted. Bruce no longer fears catching AIDS from Bobby. We take some precautions with ourselves it's not like we have different kinds of laundry or different sense of sets of sheets or different uh, uh, glassware or anything like that. You know, we live together, we sleep together, we're man and wife. The AIDS virus is not easy to catch. It requires direct and intimate contact with blood or bodily fluids in order to spread. So AIDS can be prevented. But for those already infected, the question remains, can AIDS be treated? An effective treatment will have to find a way to disrupt the viral life cycle within a human cell. When the AIDS virus binds to the T cell's outer membrane, it injects its genetic core inside the cell. As a retrovirus, its genes are stored in an unusual form on a chemical variant of DNA called RNA. A special enzyme, reverse transcriptase, is needed before the virus can translate the RNA into normal DNA and replicate. 
Researchers at the National Cancer Institute in Washington have been leading the hunt for a drug that might block the reverse transcription process. They've tested hundreds of substances and narrowed the search to the contents of what is known as the magic box. All of these compounds show some promise against the AIDS virus, and most of them work in a similar way. They're all chemical modifications of the natural building blocks used by the virus to make the DNA copy of its genes. A small molecular change can transform a building block into a chemical stop sign. No further building blocks can be added and replication of the viral genes grinds to a halt. To determine which chemicals work best, Scientists have developed a simple comparative test. Both tubes contain cultures of human T cells, the cells the AIDS virus attacks. But the cells on the left have been infected by the virus, and the colony at the bottom of the test tube is smaller. The virus is killing those cells. To find out if a chemical can stop the virus, a sample of the drug is added to a newly infected tube. This time, the two colonies stay the same size, so this drug is protecting the T-cells from the virus. But will it work in humans? I think one always has to bear in mind that a tissue culture technique may not predict for what happens in a person. There are many other factors in a person. There's toxicity of the drug against various organs. There's how a given drug can be handled by various parts of the body. There may be inherent sites in a person that are essentially immune, so to speak, from the effects of a drug, where a drug cannot reach or cannot be metabolized actively enough to bring about an effect. So I think that it is a leap of faith to assume that because one has an agent that works in a test tube, that one will have an agent that will work in human beings. One of the most promising of the chemicals is called AZT. Testing of AZT began in July 1985 on a small group of AIDS patients. Bobby was one of them. I was scared about going down to Washington. I looked terrible at the time. I could just tell by how the people were looking at me that, you know, they might not have wanted me, because, you know. And I tried to look good that day because I, I wanted so desperately to be in the program. You know, I made my face up, but I, I was just so darn weak at the time. But they accepted me in. The first day that we were there, they gave me um, the drug, but they just did it a one-day thing. Test dose. Yeah, I guess to see if I wasn't allergic to and that it was getting into my system. And they brought me to my room. It was a lovely room. I had a lovely view. I met all the nurses who were really friendly to me. And I was thinking, what's going on here? Everybody's being so friendly and nice to me. You know, why is this going on? Don't they know what disease I have? Hello. Every two weeks, Bobby flies down from New York at government expense for a careful evaluation of how well the drug is suppressing the virus in her body. How is it like? Not bad. It, you know, 45 minutes, but it was on time and everything, so it ended up being okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Step up on the scales, please. Okay. And we'll get your weight. 50.3. Oh, good. I was 49 last time, so another kilo. Very good. Mm-hmm. Objective signs of how well Bobby is responding to the treatment are essential. Dr. Sam Broder must decide how much Bobby's well-being is due to the drug and how much to her remarkable determination to overcome the virus. Tell me a little bit about what's been happening since well, we saw Well, the first thing is, look here. There was a button there, and today I sat down and snapped. I've put on quite a bit of weight. How much have you gained? I've gained, well, today I'm 50 point three kilograms, which I've never weighed that in my life before. So about your fevers? Any I haven't had any fevers at all. My, te my temperature is usually 37 exactly. Okay. So, no, things are going really well. Well, I'm very pleased. I, in all fairness, I can't... You know, yeah, I mean, you don't know how pleased we are. Yeah. I mean, we are so happy right now. But you have to understand that, although I'm extremely gratified about your yes. response, I can't be sure well. that the drug that we gave you did this. I mean, it's way too soon to make that conclusion, but... At least I attribute to the drug, though. I do. <laughs> I don't care what anybody else says. It's the drug. <laughs> Despite Broder's professional caution, Bobby's positive response to AZT was shared by other AIDS victims early in the clinical trials. 
In September 1986, AZT was made available to many AIDS patients on a much wider basis. It is the first true ray of hope in the long battle against the disease. Your dose is 12 ml every four hours. For patients, it's a lifeline to clutch onto, although it must be taken every four hours, night and day. How much of a supply is this? This is a week supply. Okay. You know, I'm convinced that perhaps I'll have to be on this drug the rest of my life, but it's, you know, it's not that bad. Okay, you thank go. you. Bye-bye. Bye now. I just feel that the drug is making me better. The researchers stress that there are still many uncertainties about AZT. It stops the virus from multiplying, but can't undo the damage already done to the immune system. So it's considered a treatment, not a cure for AIDS. And its potential for dangerous side effects is still unknown. But it offers Bobby, and many others, the precious gift of time. Obviously, she's doing very well, and I think that her immune system is not getting any worse so that even if she would to get another infection it could be treated and she'd get better and we have a lot of time i think now uh, and i'm sure that certainly in the time that we have a cure will be found mm -hmm. i'm confident of that if a cure can be found it will probably be based on recent breakthroughs in understanding the virus particularly the workings of its genes like all retroviruses, the AIDS virus has three standard genes. The first makes the core proteins that protect the virus's genetic material. The second makes the reverse transcriptase enzyme, already the target of several experimental drugs. The third makes the spiky outer shell. But the AIDS virus has extra genes that scientists have never seen before. One of them, called the transactivator, controls the way the whole virus reproduces. The transactivator comes into play long after the initial infection by the AIDS virus. The virus can remain dormant for years, but when the immune system is activated to fight off another infection, the virus within the critical T cells begins to multiply. The transactivator gene plays a crucial role in this process. Without that transactivator, the virus is completely dead. Just can't grow. That was not predicted from anything we knew about other viruses. We had predicted that it would just replicate slowly, like most other viruses, without its transactivator. However, we find, without its transactivator, no growth at all. That has an important implication for therapeutic uh, intervention for making new drugs uh, for AIDS viruses. What we are always looking for are things that a virus does that a cell doesn't do. And this particular positive feedback loop is unique to this virus. Cells don't do it. It's a viral gene product. And what's very important is that it's a viral gene product without which the virus cannot grow. Therefore, we have a new target for anti-AIDS drugs. So the search for treatments will not stop with AZT. Right now, four other experimental anti-AIDS compounds are undergoing preliminary testing in humans. One of the drugs, like AZT, is designed to interfere with the virus life cycle. Two others to destroy infected cells, and one to bolster the body's immune system. Drugs which show promise will be further tested, both alone and in combination. Initial results of these trials will be known in early 1987 and it is possible that additional treatment could be made available to AIDS victims within five years. But what about a vaccine that would prevent infection in the first place? If an AIDS vaccine is ever made, it will be traced back to this house in Scotland. More than a hundred cats lived here with their eccentric owner. In the early 1960s, a number became ill with an infectious form of leukemia. The mini-epidemic was brought to the attention of Bill Jarrett at Glasgow University. The culprit turned out to be a retrovirus, and Jarrett was eventually able to develop a vaccine to protect cats from the disease. It was the first and only vaccine against a retrovirus, and it provides a model for AIDS vaccine research. Well, the basic principle is the same in them all. You're trying to preserve 
a certain set of molecules which are on the surface of the virus. And the virus uses these molecules, they stick out from the surface, and it uses them to penetrate the cells of the body. Say, common cold going into your nose, these prongs on the virus, so to speak, stick into the cell, and that's the way the virus gets into the cell. And when, you're, when you become immune to a disease, like the common cold, your body has generated molecules which stop, attach onto these spikes or on the virus and stop it getting into the cells. Now, the, the idea of every vaccine, and there are many different ways of making vaccines, is to preserve these molecules and present them to the body in such a way that the body thinks that it's the virus and responds to it. So a vaccine looks like a virus to the body, but contains no harmful materials. It's made up of molecules with spiky outer shells, similar in shape to the virus, which alert the immune system tricking it into manufacturing protective antibodies. These antibodies then stand guard to recognize and repel any later attempt at infection by a real virus. But traditional approaches to making vaccines don't work against the AIDS retrovirus. To give you an example, we would rule out immediately using a live virus. I have mutants in the laboratory that have been developed here about a year ago that do not kill the T cell, they infect. They infect, but they seem to do nothing harmful. One might say, gee, that's a vaccine. I would think that would be crazy because they probably would cause leukemia after a while because remember, these are retroviruses and the other name for retroviruses are leukemia viruses. So if you don't die of AIDS, you might die of a malignancy, a cancer, especially a leukemia or a lymphoma. Okay, so we dismiss mutant viruses. The next Thing you might say is what about an inactive virus a whole virus inactivated we would rule that out too because at least for the time being you have nucleic acid in this virus that it would be very hard to prove would not be damaging to someone so at centers around the country scores of scientists have had to develop new techniques in their search for an aids vaccine the key to a vaccine, they believe, lies in using only one part of the virus, its spiky outer shell, known as the envelope. By itself, it can't harm the body, but might be able to induce an immune response. One approach to manufacturing this empty envelope for experiments begins with growing the virus itself. Here at Frederick, we produce virus under highly contained conditions, called P3 conditions, for protection of the investigators. Individuals have to enter through a limited access doorway. They dress in protective clothing. The air balance is set such that the air is negative to all of the rest of the building. The virus is propagated inside of cells that we keep in a large walk-in incubator. We produce somewhere around 250 liters a week. The, since we've been in operation, we produce somewhere in the range of 12,000 liters of virus. That's 3,000 gallons. Should total up to be somewhere around 1,000 trillion virus particles. The virus is harvested twice a week. It's separated from the cells in which it grows and purified to extract the critical spiky outer shell. To elicit the strongest possible immune response, a few drops of an experimental enzyme are added to the virus shells, which are made of pure protein. The mixture is then placed in a dialysis bag, where the two substances slowly react with one another. If conditions are just right, the enzyme causes the viral proteins to clump together, forming miniature particles called immune-stimulating complexes, or ISCOMs. The hope is that these ISCOMs will be highly visible to the immune system and induce the body to mount an effective defense against the real AIDS virus. Another promising approach to making a vaccine comes from recombinant DNA technology. These genetic engineering techniques do not use the virus itself. Instead, they begin by extracting the gene that makes the viral envelope. Then they put the gene into another living cell, which acts like a tiny factory producing pure envelope protein. 
Like ISCOMs, these proteins should fortify the immune system against the virus. But manufacturing a prototype vaccine is only the beginning. The first step in the vaccine is to see whether you can make it. And the second step is to put it into animals. There is no way of testing a vaccine apart from doing animal experiments. So that's in the monkeys. And the first thing we measure then, as I said, was whether the monkeys managed to produce antibodies against that. We have tried different doses of the vaccine. We had to start with very small doses to make sure it was safe and didn't harm the monkeys. It didn't. So we've stepped up the dose now, and this has produced a very good antibody response. That's stage two. Lab animals have produced strong antibodies in response to experimental vaccines. But scientists have been unable to tell if these antibodies can protect against AIDS. To find out if the vaccine does provide protection from the virus, it must be tested in the only animal vulnerable to the AIDS virus other than man, chimpanzees. Results from the first set of experiments with chimps will be known by midwinter 1987. By then, the incubation period of the virus will be over. If the chimps continue to be healthy, the vaccine is protecting them from the disease. Our primate relatives may offer another ray of hope. One species of monkey, the African green, naturally carries a virus very similar to the AIDS virus. This may be how AIDS began. A chance scratch or bite may have caused this virus to jump from monkey to man, where it later mutated into the deadly form we know as AIDS today. But the African green monkey never becomes ill. This fact sparked an entirely new line of inquiry by researchers Myron Essex and Phyllis Kanke of the Harvard School of Public Health. They wondered if a benign form of the AIDS virus could exist in people, like the harmless one that infects monkeys. They began their search in West Africa. There, they took blood samples from prostitutes, a population they suspected would likely have been exposed to the AIDS virus. When they examined the blood, they found that their hunch had been correct. They had discovered a new virus, a close relative of the AIDS virus called HTLV-4, like the green monkey virus, it infects T cells, but it doesn't kill them. People carrying this new virus are healthy, and perhaps it's even protecting them against AIDS. And I think probably the most important thing is that these people are apparently healthy. There hasn't been AIDS or other related clinical syndromes like AIDS in this region of Africa. So it could be, uh, it's at least a possibility that the virus does not cause disease as readily as the prototype AIDS virus does. Researchers are just beginning to experiment with this new virus and to compare it to the deadly AIDS virus. The differences between the viruses in both structure and behavior may give them valuable insight into strategies for both treatment and vaccine development. But despite these advances, the task will continue to be difficult. The AIDS virus mutates and can thus evade the body's defenses. The protein spikes are what count in the immune response. Key points on the surface of these proteins are recognized by the antibodies. So an extremely small mutation in the virus can defeat antibodies produced both naturally and by a vaccine. Antibodies made to the old configuration will no longer bind and the virus can stay one jump ahead of the immune system. The major headache, I think, would be that uh, the virus may have different uh, types. You may have one type in New York and another type in San Francisco. And it's already known that there are genetic differences in the structure of these viruses. Uh, but we don't know whether uh, that means that the antigens of the virus the, the molecules that produce the immunity. We don't know whether they're different or not. This is still to be found. Um, generally, they are the same, they're the same structure and the same size, but small differences might make a difference. And this does happen in viruses. Some um, have many different types. You see, there are so many common cold viruses, dozens of them, that it's not possible to make a, a vaccine here. With rabies, there is only one type, so it's easy to make a vaccine. We don't know just where uh, AIDS lies here. And there's yet another obstacle. 
The AIDS virus might evade a vaccine entirely by entering the body already encapsulated in a cell. This foreign cell would then be engulfed by the immune system, allowing the AIDS virus to pass directly from one cell to another, undetected by any protective antibodies in the blood. Well, these are hypothetical questions, uh, and we don't know the answer to them. I mean, the only way you can do it is to try it, to suck it and see. I mean, we've got to make the vaccines. It was thought to be a daunting prospect in cat leukemia, for example, where there are several forms of the virus. But in fact, one uh, vaccine protects against all the different types. So we've just got to go ahead as usual in science and do the experiments. Progress in understanding the AIDS virus and its fundamental mechanisms has gone extremely rapidly. We've built upon a very large body of knowledge that we had accumulated from other studies of retroviruses and used all of that knowledge. We now are up to the point we are with any retrovirus and beyond that. This virus is doing truly new things that have never been seen in biology. It's as if something had come up out of the depths of the sea encrusted with new biological organisms that we had never seen before. And I think that what we will learn from this virus will help not only AIDS, but many other diseases, leukemia and other chronic human diseases. If AIDS were almost any other disease, the level of scientific understanding achieved so far would be considered remarkable. But with a number of new cases doubling every eight months and extending beyond the initial risk groups, there's a heightened sense of urgency. And efforts to overcome the virus are intensifying. Yet the scientists are painfully aware of their limits. We're usually confident of our ability, our technological ability to solve problems. And I think that's given us a great sense of comfort in this disease, and I think it's a false sense of comfort. We, that is, we who work with the fundamental aspects of this virus, know how far away we are from even understanding its workings, understanding how it causes the diseases it causes, and even some aspects of how it's transmitted. We have many areas of uncertainty. Not the least of our uncertainties are how to stop it. Although there is some hope now for drugs and some hope for vaccines, we can't, and nobody with reliability can predict when and if we can slow down the spread of the disease or even stop what appears now to be an inevitable decline once the disease begins. So we are a long way from being able to control it. So in the absence of a medical solution, the only certain way to halt the spread of AIDS is to discourage the behaviors that place people at risk. This will require public education on a large scale. A model for the effectiveness of public education is San Francisco, where the AIDS epidemic was first seen among homosexual men. Here, a determined effort has been made to teach people about the danger from the virus. San Francisco is also where they've been charting the progress of the disease for the longest time. One of the studies is being run by epidemiologist Andrew Moss. When we began working on AIDS in 1982, first thing we did was we did was a, uh, a study in this neighborhood, and uh, we found out that about uh, one in 300 gay men living in a mile of here had AIDS, and now it's about one in 30. In this area of San Francisco, well over half of the gay men are now infected with the AIDS virus. And this has made them especially cooperative. The participation rate was amazing. It's because the gay men who lived here wanted the disease to be sold. They wanted it to be understood and cured down and so forth. Their determination to fight AIDS led to a massive educational campaign. The people of San Francisco were bombarded with AIDS information. They were informed of how AIDS is spread and how to avoid getting it. The message prevent AIDS by changing sexual behavior. The entire city was put on alert, and the effort continues today. This man's lover died of AIDS four years ago. Since that time, he's been participating in one of the studies, part of an ongoing survey to monitor the disease. The scientists are trying to chart its course, and they're looking for clues that will tell them if education has made a difference. When all this first started, there was no information whatsoever on AIDS. And uh, when he was dying from AIDS, he had asked me to get involved in this program. 
Every year, a few days before Christmas, he arrives at Ward 86, the AIDS clinic, to become a vital statistic in the survey. I'd like you to lift your tongue up to the top of your mouth. Good. And stick your tongue way out. The medical examination is only the beginning. Volunteers are also asked to reveal the history of their sex life. What they did, with whom, how often, and with what protection. Your uh, sexual habits change uh, since you were last here? Well, I used to go, uh, a few years ago, I used to go to the baths. I used to meet uh, men on the buses and on the street and stuff. And ever since the information on AIDS came out, and I've had a few friends who have died from AIDS, ever since then, um, I've really stopped doing all that stuff. Uh, what about um, safe sex practices? Uh, pretty much I don't have uh, intercourse with, any, with anyone. Because I figure that's uh, the biggest risk that you can be taking right now. I'll loosen the tourniquet in just a moment. Does such sexual restraint actually make a difference? The answer can be found in the blood of Andrew Moss's subjects. And there are signs that education has slowed the spread of the virus. What we see is a flattening out. Um, after four years in which numbers went like this, numbers are now going like this. We see about 60 cases of AIDS a month in San Francisco and have done for the last year. Now, what does this mean? I think it reflects a major change in sexual behavior amongst gay men in San Francisco beginning three or four years ago. We're finally beginning to see the results of that in the incidence data. But I want to make a caveat. What we see, what we measure, what we count is just AIDS as it has been defined for the last four years. And the AIDS virus is a retrovirus and we know that retroviruses can have lifelong manifestations. And it's possible that what's flattening out and maybe going away is just the early manifestations of the virus and that we'll see new manifestations later on in its course. It's been suggested that primary neurological AIDS or perhaps a kind of lymphomas, a subgroup of lymphomas, may be diagnoses that we'll see more of. So we want to be cautious and watch it carefully before we say it's going away. Scientists will continue their search for a vaccine and a cure for AIDS. But for now, the answer lies in prevention. For some individuals, that will mean changes in behavior. For society, it will mean guaranteeing that educational efforts take place. Then, just possibly, AIDS can be stopped. more importantly, people have to hear it, realize that the problem is a small one, probably with few people, but that that small problem with small numbers affects directly or indirectly almost everyone. For more information on AIDS, call toll-free 800 342 AIDS. AZT Information Hotline 800 843 9388. Smoking Dilemma is the topic on Managing Our Miracles tonight at 10 o'clock. Stay with us now for The Africans with Ali Mazrui, next on WETA Channel 26. Thank you. 